again. Welcome. James 2, 14 through 26. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. Now, it is a dicey one, so we are going to have a lot of fun. Before we take a look at it, let's look back. Challenge follow-up. Last week, we challenged you to write and to do one thing that you can do to honor somebody who doesn't live in the limelight, but is a faithful, humble follower of Christ. How did that go? So, now that we sort of looked back, Let's go ahead, push on forward to James 2, 14 through 26. I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to look through, and then I'm, I am going to have you guys buddy up today, slash group up, and uh, we're going to talk through two things. Uh, so how do you think the theme shifts in these verses? They do shift, so sort of be looking at that. Um, repeated words are a good clue, so if you want to look for some repeated words there. And then if you spend a couple minutes and you get through, okay, in our group, how we think the theme shifts, then go ahead and talk about one question that you have about the passage. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to do that. Go. So, now that you guys have gotten to the text a little bit, you're starting to ask some good questions. It's fantastic. We are going to segue forward into James 2, 14 through 26. But before we do, if I go through the roof shaking, I'm going to shake this podium. What do we have to look at? Context. Okay, that wasn't quite roof shaking, but I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> we have to look at the context. So remember last week, we talked about James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Um, we talked about how part of applying God's word to our lives. Remember back to James 1, we were talking about looking into the mirror. The mirror is God's law. We don't want to just look into the mirror and see spinach in our teeth and be like, that's fantastic. Now I'm gonna walk away and just forget that I have spinach in my teeth, that's silly. No, 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 you wanna get the spinach out of your teeth. So James is all about looking into the mirror, seeing what's wrong and changing, obedience to God's word. So last week that we said part of this is treating everybody with mercy, uh, regardless of financial status. We explored how James basically obliterates these poor believers. I mean, I mean, not the poor believers. He obliterated the believers who were abusing the poor believers. They are now poor believers because they've been obliterated by James. But uh, because these believers were basically humiliating these other people, and they were lifting up these rich people who were coming in, and James is like, excuse me, this is absurd. Because first of all, God honors the poor, so how dare you? And secondly, the rich are the ones who are oppressing you. Get your brain screwed on straight. What, what are you doing? Stop it. So, James concluded and said, hey, this is serious. Remember, one day you will be judged. Don't show partiality. You don't want to be judged with that measure. Show mercy. With that same measure will be measured unto you. If you are merciful to others, that is a type of faith that pleases God, and he will then be pleased with us. Now, as we slide into this next section, I, hopefully you did notice that there is a shift in theme. I told you that there was. There is a shift um, in topic. James is still talking about the overall category of living out God's word. But his focus is no longer just on elevating the rich unjustly and pushing down the poor. The topic moves to a relationship between faith and works. And again, color coding really helps that pop out to you as you go through. Just underlining does work as well. But using a color coding system is a bomb. I love it. So, uh, again, you're going to see that shift in theme as we go through. And his launching point for works is providing what's needed for poor believers. Now, to get the understanding of these verses, it's helpful to get a big picture perspective and to think about the passage as a whole in sort of an interpretational pattern before we go verse by verse. So, a couple of things to point out to you. In verses 14 and 16, we have the repetition of the phrase, what good is it? In verses 17 and 26, James calls faith without works dead. In verse 20, James says that faith without works is useless. Notice sort of that parallelism of ideas there, dead and useless. And then, James claims that two Old Testament characters were justified <coughs> by works and not just faith. Now James is using all of these to tell us the same story. 
but what story is he telling? There are a few predominant views on this passage. Let's go over them one by one, and then I'll, I'll sort of cue you into which one I'm leaning toward. Number one, a true believer will always show that their faith is genuine by works. If your life does not show works, then you must not be saved. <laughs> yes, as Seth went, Meh. so, so um, I, I hope that we can all think of somebody in our life, perhaps us at one point in our life, whenever we can say, okay, that person truly believes, they've had a genuine conversion experience, they have placed their faith in Jesus. Again, we've moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We are sealed by the spirit, the spirit indwells us, and then either a heart is hardened, you're backslidden, you've been trapped into sin, you become complacent, and there's no works in your life. Does that mean that all of a sudden you're not saved? Or that your faith is somehow not genuine? Oh gosh, I hope not. <laughs> you know, that's a terrifying way to live, you know? Um, there are some people, there are some commentators who will hold to this perspective, and we would reject it. We would say that this is not what this passage is talking about. I'll give you some reasons as we go through in a moment, but that's the first view. Second view is that faith is needed alongside works in order to get saved. That if the faith sort of takes the first steps, but then you need works to complete your faith. If you don't have works, then you're not saved because you need to earn that last little bit. This we would call out as patently heretical. So we would say that this is, this is not true. This is not good doctrine. This is countered by a number of other passages in scripture. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, the one the classic. It is, not, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Right? This is our, our faith, our salvation is a gift that we receive, not something that we somehow claw our way into because we've done things. Now Catholics, many Catholics, uh, will hold to this position, and they will interpret this passage with that framework in mind. And so if you're in a conversation with a Catholic, know that that's the framework that they're using as they're going through and looking at these verses. Again, we at Berean would reject this. We would say that this is, this is not correct. View number three. Faith alongside works. Faith that is shown in your life, or you could say faith with feet, is a faith that is pleasing and valuable to God. If you don't have works, that type of faith is not the type of faith that is useful or that is valuable to God. Now, this is the view that we'll be going through tonight. This is the interpretational framework. Um, I'll explain much of my reasoning along the way. A lot of it's embedded in the passage itself. But my first reason is based on context. Remember James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. James is talking about how God values Faith that applies the word and doesn't just put on a show. We talked about, hey, there you have this religion that looks pretty and it's all good. You've checked, you've checked out the box. But if you're not looking into the word, looking into that mirror, and making changes in your life, putting your faith in action, then that, that is not something that God values. God values a faith that is active in the world. And we said, hey, we're going to look at some different examples. Example number one was partiality. Don't unjustly elevate some people and unjustly humiliate other people. Show mercy across the board. That's one aspect of living out God's word in the world. Aspect number two is don't just have this faith that's in your head. That's great, but it needs to make its presence known in the world. So, again, I will go into details along the way, but let's go ahead and jump on in with that framework in mind. Starting at the top. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, oh, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, throughout this passage, James uses a series of rhetorical questions to engage his readers. In this first section, James has a parallel set of questions. What good is it? What good is it? And then in the middle, he sandwiches an example. 
and presents his initial conclusion at the very end. Now, before I advance this thought, I would like to draw your attention to a very critical word right there that happens to be what? Brothers. Brothers, which means he's talking to what? Christians. Right. He's talking to believers. Now, again, there are people, there are commentators who will address this passage, and they will say, well, James is talking to people who think they're Christians. <laughs> but they're really not. They're really, they're deceived. As we go through, pay attention to what James is saying. Again, as we've noted before, the language and tone isn't a salvation call. He's not saying, come to faith for the first time. What's he saying? Hey, my flock, you have made a disconnect. You have made an error. You think that this is how you're supposed to live and that you're okay over here. Nope, you, you're, you're off the beaten path. Come back over here. This is what really pleases God. And so, again, as you go through, think about what, what he's saying and how he's saying it. Does it sound like he's calling them to a salvation, eternal salvation message? Or does it sound like he's calling to his flock to change their mind about something? So keep that in mind as we go through. So uh, his first rhetorical question is the first of several hypotheticals. If someone says, now, just because it's a hypothetical doesn't mean that it wasn't actually happening, but it is at least a hypothetical. He's at least coming up with some example. It could be something that's actually happening in reality, or it could just be out of James's head. We don't know. The, the Greek language doesn't say for sure one way or the other. It's at least a hypothetical. So the question that he asks is, what good is it? Now this phrase is actually a little bit better translated. How is it useful or profitable? Um, how useful is it if you have a faith that doesn't make an impact? And this is a rhetorical question. The anticipated response is, well, it's not useful. It's not profitable. This type of faith that is just up in the sky but doesn't do anything isn't useful. It isn't good for anything. So James says, can that faith save you? Now, this is, again, one of those interesting phrases that you take a look at and you go, well, it's a little bit awkward. What does that mean? Now, the word save in Greek is like the word love in English. In one breath, you can say to your best friend, oh, I love you. In the next breath, you can say, I love Jesus. And I really hope that you mean something different by those two phrases. But it's the exact same word, right? It's not a different word. It's the same word. Context allows you to in interpret the word correctly. Same thing here. The word save has a wide range of meanings, and it's used in a wide range of meanings throughout the, the New Testament. So we have, again, four basic options for what James is saying here. First one, again, is that he's talking about an eternal salvation. Again, we would say that this is not what's going on here. Uh, Salvation is not the topic. Eternal salvation is not the topic. He's not calling them to a repentance from the first sin to come into God's kingdom. Um, and again, we know that people can be saved, but struggle. So it's not eternal state that's in question here. Now, because I always hesitate to go overboard on one side, I do want to come back on the other side and say that certainly we can probably think of people who we've interacted with who have made claims about being saved. They have the right words. They may do the right things. But there's no visible desire to change a, you know, a sinful lifestyle. There's no desire to pray, to get into God's word, to you know, get close to God. No desire for accountability. And while I would hesitate, in fact, I would step back from the place of saying, well then, that person must not be saved because can I judge somebody's heart? No, I can't. But what I can do is say, you know, my friend, I feel like you may want to examine your heart because I see these things and they just, I just feel like there's something missing here. And so I'm just concerned about you, my friend. And so that's, that's certainly something that can happen to people where they have 
they can say the right things and pick up the lingo, but their heart hasn't actually experienced the tra transformative power of salvation. So that's something that can happen. Again, I don't think that's what's going on here. So, view number two. James is asking, can a faith that's not showing works prevent a person from losing their physical life early? Now this is a view taken by Dr. Constable. He says, and this is, some, this is a continuation of the track that he's taken earlier, where he's talking about, hey, if you continue in sin and you don't turn away from sin, and you're going to experience death, and he's talking about the same thing here. While that's more plausible in this context than the first option, I again don't think it fits. If you look at the situation as a whole, if you look at the entire passage, it really doesn't, it just doesn't jive. You're like, eh, it's not really, it, it just doesn't fit with just with the context. There, it, there's nothing, again, inherent in the word itself that says it can't mean that, but it just doesn't fit in the context. Uh, view number three is again going back to James chapter 1 verse 21 and when we talked about how the believers received with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls we talked about how in the context of what's going on here it seems best to interpret that in terms of sanctification that part of the salvation process which again you've already been justified you're set aside in God's kingdom but the faith that changes you that bring salvation to light inside of you is a faith that does something. It's not just something that lives inside your head. And so I think that that's the best understanding of what's going on here. Now you're like, Mariah, well, what about the fourth view? Well, the fourth view is the Mariah special. So this is, this is, this is a unique view that I came up with on my own and that I'm not necessarily advocating for, but just so you understand what the, the sorts of things that go on inside my head. The Greek pronoun right here for him is an ambiguous pronoun. So it can be him, it can be them, it can be either. It's also not directional. So it can point backward or it can point forward. So what good is it? Remember, there's no grammar in Greek. So what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save? The next phrase talks about the hypothetical situation of the brother or sister who is hungry without clothes and someone says to them hey you person i would love for you to be well can that faith help that brother the faith that's just in their head no it can't it doesn't do anything for them so again that's the mariah special it doesn't if it, no there's there is no commentary support for that <laughs> but so that's why I'm hesitant to say, I really think that that's the view. I think that it's probably more likely that it's sanctification is what's going on here. But I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by that option. I think that that's a possible option. I would love for other people who are smarter and wiser than I am to also come alongside that view before I publish that view. But <laughs> so um, that's, those are the four different options. I, again, will go with sanctification is what is in mind here. So. Let's take a look at the actual hypothetical that James presents. And this hypothetical is not hard to bring into the modern day context. Let's read it over again. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So. Think of the overworked mom who confesses that becoming a single mom after her husband dies has been so hard and she's so tired. And one of you says, oh, God bless. Good luck with those kiddos. I hope they give you a break sometime soon. Instead of offering to watch the kids for the afternoon. Or think of the wheelchair bound senior who sighs at the state of her weed ridden yard. And one of you says, again, one of you, oh, don't worry. No one really looks at people's lawns. You just need to focus on the Lord instead of just offering to pull the weeds. Or think of the college friend who unexpectedly loses a child, has asked for financial support. And one of you says, oh, that is just so sad. Just take, take comfort in the Lord. 
Warm wishes are the norm. Action is the anomaly. Now, I want to affirm that this is not a universal statement. This is also not a, a statement of condemnation. I know we just talked about times whenever we have actually done things for people and literally like we just like we just did this. So I, I know that and I can name off the top of my head probably 30 things within the last month that I that I know of of people in our in our group who have done things for people. So it's not like again I'm not name calling or anything. But those sorts of situations are ones that we've found ourselves in at some point or another. And that's what James is referring to in these verses. And once more James asks what benefit is that? He's not asking, hey, can you get eternally saved from this? No, no, no. He's saying, what good is that? That type of faith. The faith that just says, oh, go and be well. And then walks away. No, no use at all. Now, James uses a figure of speech to dramatize what he's talking about here. So let's go ahead and break the image down. We have those four different aspects. The literal figure, the literal expression, is something that is dead. That was hard, right? It's something that's not alive. It's, it's not moving. It's, it's dead. It's, it's on the ground. So the type of figure is a metaphor in this case. There's a direct linkage. There's no like or as. It's just there. The point of contact, what's being compared with what? So dead things. Do they move? No. no. Well, I really hope not, right? So they don't move. They don't benefit anyone. They don't do anything useful. And so the meaning is faith that expresses itself only in words is as useless to the world around it as a corpse is. It's useless. It's pointless. It doesn't do anything. Pretty straightforward. Onward and upward. Next section. But someone will say, are you happy? And I have what? Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Some of James's phrasing is just so whoo, a little shiver. So James presents, and this is a, a, a common rhetorical practice at this time, he presents a hypothetical rebuttal. So somebody he's as writing as if somebody had come come up to him and said, oh, but what about this? So he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he's basically saying, hey, this person over here, they emphasize the faith side of it. This person emphasizes the works side of it. Well, can't we just sort of divide labor and get along? Like, what's the harm in that? And that's sort of the equivalent of saying, oh, well, I just don't have the spiritual gift of works. But I have the spiritual gift of prayer. So I'm just, I just pray for, I just, I just, and now, of course, there's a time to pray. There are times whenever literally the only thing you can do is pray, as especially I think of, we have some prayer warriors in the church who are like, I can't do very much anymore, but I can pray. It's like, that's, that's good. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you have the ability to do things and you say, ah, oh, that's just not what God didn't make me for that. James is like, Sorry, let's rip that idea to a shred. So he has a twofold parry here. Uh, parry part one, he uses sarcasm. And we're going to cross reference 1 Kings 18. You don't have to turn there. This is the story of the prophet Elijah up on Mount Carmel. And he's countering the false prophets of Baal. And he's in the middle of this showdown with the prophets. And we have the two altars that are being built and they're both going to be trying to call down fire from their their god right and so the prophets of baal are trying to get the attention of their false god baal and of course because he's a false god they're doing all this crazy stuff and what's happening nothing, nothing, nothing right because he's a false god so um they're doing all of this crazy stuff there's nothing that's happening and verse 27 reads and at noon elijah mocks them saying cry aloud for he is a god, either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. So here too, Elijah's implied comment is, he is a god, right? So he can, oh, but wait, he can't. And so that's sort of the same sort of feeling that 
we get here, James is saying, show me your faith apart from your works. Oh, but wait, you can't. You, there is no way to show your faith unless you're expressing it through works. And that's his next phrase. I will show you my faith by my works. That's how your faith is evident in the world. It's whenever you do something. It's not whenever you are like, oh, I have this really great proper theology and it's inside my head and I just know that's my faith and it's amazing. And you're like, James is like, no, no. And that's the point of this next phrase, Harry part two. Demon faith, right? So he's basically, again, employing another wonderful um, practice of the time, classic debate move. He acknowledges the truth of his opponent's claims he gives him a little pat on the back for affirming the theological truth of the Trinity. Okay, our God is just one God. Fantastic. It's not multiple deities scattered all over the place. Yay, good job. Unfortunately, James has bad news for these believers. Even the demons believe that. Awkward. The demon's faith, such as it is, does nothing for them. At least nothing good. Though they are technically correct, their relationship with God is based in fear, and their faith is useless. By holding out these believers' adherence to correct theology, but neglecting to translate that faith into action, James is saying that that faith is no better than the demon's faith. It's not doing any good. Ouch, right? You, you, feel, you felt that one, right? You felt it right here. So correct doctrine by itself is not sufficient in order to have a faith that pleases God. Let's keep going. Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Now, the word that James uses for fool here is kainos, or something like that. Again, do I speak Greek? No. Thank you. Steph knows. Steph knows I know you speak Greek. <laughs> One of these days, but it's not today. So... Uh, the idea behind this phrase so it definitely does imply sort of an you know, intellectual deficiency, but it's not just that you have a low IQ. There's a spiritual component as well. That spiritually, you're cl you close your mind to a truth. So don't be a spiritual dum dum. Don't don't be a spiritual dum dum. So James is essentially saying, "Hey, I've shown you these things. Will you please?" Please, oh my gosh. Just listen. Don't, don't, do, do I need to go on? Do I really? I hope not. Have you got it yet? You know what? We're just going to keep moving. And so James is, again, he's exasperated, but he's pleading. And he's, again, he's talking to these brothers. He wants them to get it. He's not talking to some people that he doesn't know. This is his flock. And he's trying to bring them alongside. He's inviting them to come to learn to see. And again, notice what James says here. Faith apart from works is useless. What's the emphasis here? It's what's the impact that your faith is making in the world? That's what he's talking about here. So James is going to provide two separate examples of people whose faith was not useless. We're going to talk about them one by one. Let's look at, first of all, Abraham, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Now we've got a whole lot of faith, active, works, all this stuff, so again, we're going to sort of break down phrase by phrase. We have to start back with Abraham. Who is Abraham? What's going on here? So we have um, the idea of Abraham. You guys, you guys know who Abraham is. He is the founder of the entire Jewish nation. Before Abraham, there were no Jews. He is literally the the dude that God plucked out of the pagan nations and was like, "You, who are you? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start a new thing. We're going to make a nation out of you." And so to understand how James is using Abraham as an example, we do need to do a little bit of Old Testament flyover so that we can recap Abraham's faith journey. So um, Abraham 
he does, uh, so this is Genesis 12, he follows God's call, he leaves his hometown in Ur, and he sets off toward Canaan, the land of promise. Now, before Abraham leaves Ur, God promises that through Abraham, um, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And Abraham doesn't quite pick up what God is putting down. Abraham's old, his wife is old, and they don't have any kids. So Abraham's not really sure what's going on, but he's definitely not thinking that God's going to give him kids. So he, again, he has this initial promise, Genesis 12, and he's following, but he's a little bit hazy on the details. So along the way, God pulls Abraham to the side and again promises him blessing through descendants. This is from Genesis 15. I'm reading from verses 5 and 6. And he, God, brought him, Abraham, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted to him as righteousness. Now, this, this verse that I just read, is what James is quoting not here, but a couple of verses down in verse 23. Whenever he says, hey, this is the salvation moment. In Genesis 15, at the beginning of Abraham's faith journey, whenever he believes the promise of God that through him, through his descendants, the nations of the world will be blessed. That's the faith moment. That's his justification. Now, in Galatians 3, Paul explains that this faith justified Abraham, that God declared him righteous in his sight. And Paul explains that this also sets a pattern for us. We can't declare ourselves righteous by our works. It's all God's doing through faith. So, what's up with this whole double justification here? Well, let's take a closer look at that word, justified. Now, if you've been with Pastor Jeff for any length of time doing Bible study at all, at all, you will know from forwards, backwards, upside down, sideways, upside down, all the, all the different directions, that justified, the definition is to be declared righteous, specifically to be declared righteous by God. And that is true. And that's the meaning in verse 23. However, <laughs> there is another meaning of the word justified. And it can also mean to be demonstrated to be righteous. And so, let's take another look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father shown to be righteous by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, Genesis 22 tells a story, and again, you're familiar with the story, whenever God tells Abraham, hey, you've now had your son. He's starting to grow up. He's um, he's in teen years, he's young. This son, whom you love, take him up on the mountain. And you know what? Go ahead and sacrifice him. Just just kill him as an altar, as a sacrifice, on the altar as a sacrifice to me. Go ahead, have fun. What does Abraham do? He takes his son and he goes up on the mountain and he puts him on the altar and he raises a knife and he's getting ready to plunge that knife and an angel shows up and is like, oh, okay, we see, okay, got it, cool. You have shown your faith. It's not that he didn't believe before and now he believes. He's demonstrating his faith. His faith is literally being shown by his actions. Now, in case you're like, I haven't heard that story in a while, what's the end of that story? So, of course, what happens then is that God brings a ram out. And they take that, and they sacrifice that instead of Isaac. So Isaac's good. He has a little bit of a rough relationship with his dad. He's like, Dad, you tried to kill me. And he's like, look. So it was God told me to. And he's like, yeah, but it's okay. So moving on, moving on from that situation, that's what's going on here. The initial act that's quoted in verse 23 is his justification, his salvation moment. And that salvation is shown up Whenever he goes and he offers Isaac on the altar, we see that Abraham believed God by what he did. We're told in Genesis 15 that he believed God. Why is it his head? We don't know. Trying to, you know, taking a knife and just, that's showing, right? So that's the demonstration 
of his faith, the demonstration of the fact that he has been declared righteous because of his faith. Now, let's take a closer look at the process that Abraham's faith journey helps to exemplify. So the process of faith. Let's reread verse 22. You see that faith was active along with his works, and his faith was completed by his works. Now in verse 22 and in verse 24, James is going to use the phrase, you see, to front load his main observations from his examples. He wants to draw attention to these main points. And so we have in this verse two observations about how faith relates to works. So first of all, so we see that faith is active. Uh, this phrase basically just means that in this situation, the display of Abraham's salvation and his right relationship with God was accomplished through a sort of a team process of faith motivating the works and the works showing the faith. So it's sort of like the best possible group project. So it's one of those team processes where you're, you're, there's no way to really tear things apart. It's all of it is together in the situation. Again, remember back to James's hypothetical and his rebuttal, there is no way to separate out a faith from works. If you've got a faith that's really going strong, it's good. I'm going to show you my faith by my works. That's what's going on here. Now, faith was completed by his works. The word for completed will be a little bit familiar. Now, it's a slightly different form, teleo, or something like that, but it's a form of the word teleos, which we have seen earlier, uh, markedly in James 1, verse 4, that you may be made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That The context there was trials. Our faith will be brought to maturity through trials, but here the context is works. Works brought Abraham's faith to maturity. And so that's the idea here. It's not that our faith is halfway done. We, we needed to bake the mac and cheese for 20 minutes and then add some cheese. And now that we've added cheese, now the, now the mac and cheese is complete. That's not, that's not the sense of what's going on. It's that it's mature. It's been brought to its full expression. This is what faith should look like. The faith that pleases God is a faith that starts in your head and then flows out of you because that is real faith. Faith that is mature. Faith that is perfected. And again, it's not that you, so you can have a faith that's wavering, you can have a baby faith, and it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It means that it's not mature. So, that's the idea as well behind the phrase fulfilled. Verse 23, scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So Abraham's faith was brought to its full, mature end through action. When our faith is mature, we can go beyond just being safe, and we can actually become God's friend, like Abraham did. We trust him enough to do what he says. So again, he's citing this thing that happened way back then, and he's saying this event that happened is brought to completion through the act of Abraham taking the step with Isaac. It's brought to maturity. So let's finish up James's first example here. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so James is essentially saying, hey, I've shown you. All right, so this is, this is my main point. I'm just recapping, restating. A person is shown to have meaningful, mature faith in God, not just by citing great theology or by wholly sincere beliefs in their hearts, but by following God directions by obeying his word. See, that wasn't, that wasn't terribly bad, right? So let's go ahead and fly through to the second example. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So our example here is the prostitute Rahab. 
Once again, so let's go ahead and recap her situation. Um, this is in the book of Joshua. Uh, we've gone from a male to a female, from a nomad to a prostitute. Both were originally pagan foreigners, and both were brought into God's salvation plan through faith in God. So after 400 years in Egyptian slavery, and an additional 40 years in the desert, the Israelites are finally, finally, finally setting out to conquer the promised land of Canaan. Uh, the first major obstacle in their conquest is the city of Jericho, a strongly fortified city in Canaan. Uh, Joshua, who led the people after Moses died, sends a couple of spies in to check everything out. Now, I don't know if the people of Jericho were especially observant, or if these spies were just really terrible. But they get found out, like, immediately. And so... They're immediately, the, the king sending out messengers saying, hey, we've got some spies in the city, please take, take, take them captive. We've got soldiers swarming all over the place. And these, these spies have been in the, lo the locale of Rahab the prostitute. Now you're like, well, what, the, what were they doing there? Well, it's, pr it's probable that they were gathering information in, because prostitutes usually had some sort of inn and inns were places that people would go to gather information. This was probably a smart move, but did they probably stick out like a sore thumb? <laughs> yeah, probably. So um, it turns out that they are in, I would say in luck, but they are in Providence because uh, Rahab is a sympathizer and she goes, hey, let me hide you. And then whenever she pulls them out, after she, she sends the soldiers away, she says, hey. So your God, this Yahweh, he's the real deal. And I would like to transfer my allegiance to Yahweh. And please get me out because I, I, I will get you out. I'll do whatever's need, needed, but I want to be with you. Please just rescue me, right? So they do. They eventually conquer the city. They spare Rahab's life. We find out later that she ends up mo marrying an Israelite, having the descendant Boaz, having the descendant David, who has the descendant Jesus. So she ends up, again, spectacularly, in the line of Christ. So, what's the point here? Rahab's faith in the one true God would have been absolutely useless if she had merely held that sincere belief in her heart. Now, would she be in heaven? Yeah, yeah, of course. But in history, would her faith have made a difference to her? No. She would have died with the rest of the inhabitants of Jericho. The line of Christ would have come through someone else. And no one today would know of her faith. It was her faith in action that allows us to know that she had faith. Faith is shown by works. And that's what James is talking about. Her faith was not useless. She took her faith and channeled it into actions. Now this is really cool. This is one of those nerdy sort of side details that I have to point out because I have to. Uh, Abraham is sort of on one end of the spectrum as a male patriarch of the Israelite faith. Rahab is sort of on the lower end. She was a prostitute. Now we, we honor her, but again, in Israelite culture, she was not, not quite the same thing. So, so there's sort of two opposite ends of the spectrum. Anytime that opposite ends of the spectrum are used to try to indicate the whole, that's a particular type of figure of speech called a mirrorism. <coughs> I will spell it because I didn't put it up on the screen. M-E-R-I-S-M. -S -S Very fun. A mirrorism. So opposite poles meant to include the whole. So James is citing, hey, from this end to this end, these are opposite ends. Doesn't matter who you are. Everybody in, in between should be having a faith that's not just in your head, and you should be living it out. Emulate their example. So, time to put the bow on the passage on to the conclusion. For, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, once again, this is another figure of speech. It wraps back around to that first image that we had earlier of the word dead. It's a little bit different. The body without the spirit. I don't know why I really wanted to put the word sans, but I did. So, body, sans, spirit. 
Now, it's essentially the same thing, but just shrink. So you, the literal expression is the body without the animating sphere. When it's dead, right? It's just a corpse. It's just there. The type of figure here is a simile. So we do have that connecting word, so also that connecting phrase so that we know directly faith apart from works links to the body apart from the spirit, the dead thing. The point of contact, what's being compared with what? A person's body without the spirit to cause it to do life is dead, unable to do anything productive. It's just a valueless pile of meat. And so faith without the animation of works is likewise useless, lacking in value. So overall, this is a very serious, hard-hitting message. Hopefully you come away saying, I better live my faith because, oh my gosh, I don't want to be a corpse. I don't want my faith to be a corpse. And again, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about what faith does in the world. We want to have a faith that is alive, that is active, that is changing things in the world around us. So the big picture. Live the word. Put your faith into action. Don't look into the mirror. See what God wants you to do and then say, eh. I'm going to walk away. James wants his readers to know that making Christianity a creed instead of a lifestyle is not what pleases God. We have to live it. He's basically saying, hey, don't be deceived anymore. If you're not showing love to your fellow believers, putting that faith in action, you're being inconsistent and immature, just like in the prior passage. So this passage is not about salvation, but about having faith that pleases God by making a difference. You can't expect God to be happy with us if we just acknowledge him in our hearts. Our faith is alive when we reach out in love. And so, our challenge for this week, when you hear about people's needs, stop and ask God if he wants you to do something. If you feel that prompting of the Spirit, do it. Now, you may be tempted, as I have upon occasion, to say, oh, Lord, that must be the burritos from last night. That can't <laughs> possibly be your Spirit prompting me to do something. That, not that. Like, that's just crazy. Let me encourage you that if a thought pops into your head to do something that is challenging, uncomfortable, sacrificial, loving toward others, shine the light of Christ. Because that's probably the spirit. And even if it's not, just go ahead and step out on it. Just go ahead. I feel like he's going to go ahead and give you grace on that one, okay? Even if it was the burritos and he's like, ah. Oh. Because that was in good faith, all right? So go ahead and assume that it was the Spirit. If it's something that you're like, I think plausibly it could be, then just do it. If you already know of a situation, and you can already feel that, that sp Spirit prickle, where you're like, mm-hmm, I feel, mm-hmm, yeah, no, right, it's right there. And you know of the, the feeling of which I speak. Go ahead, and before you even leave tonight, write down what you could do to give your faith some peace. I love that about the tweet. <laughs> yeah. So, homework. We're going to be going over lesson nine, James 3, 1 through 12. Oh my gosh, chapter three already. <laughs> well, I know, because could I break up to 14 through 26? No, no, that is one chunk, yo. <laughs> the terrible tongue. This may be a good week to skip because it is, um, wow, convicting. I, did, I didn't say that, but I did say that because... <laughs> I want to skip that week. <laughs> now, um, if you come next week, um, I will not be up here. I will be downstairs because we are having our Thanksgiving service with church. So uh, please come, but we are not having Bible study next week. We are having our Thanksgiving service. So in two weeks, we will resume our study in James. So you have two weeks to be terribly convicted about what we say, which is very discouraging, but it's fine. 
So I'm going to turn our camera off. Goodbye, camera.